Welcome back into the Radiopedia reading room for another special mini episode. Can you believe it's day four of Radiopedia 2023 already? I can because I'm quite tired. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me, uh-oh, I'm fearing another gamma rant. It's my co-host, Frank Gaylard. Look, it's not my fault that training and licensing for nuclear medicine is sheer <laughs> madness in Australia, okay? I don't want to rehash it today. But as I said in the recent episode on this topic, this mm-hmm. is in no way a criticism of nuclear medicine as a specialty or of the very <laughs> fine folk who happily stare at images that look like normal imaging, but if you're looking through them, you know, a shower door after a steamy hot shower. <laughs> Whatever melts your butter is fine. The tassiography of radiology. <laughs> We've learned that word. If you don't know that, you haven't been listening to the podcast. Uh, so, yes, this is day four of the Radiopedia 2023 conference, and it features a 90-minute interactive nuclear medicine workshop. And Frank recently expressed rather strong opinions about the licensing around that specialty or subspecialty of radiology. So we may actually have to ban him from the live chat during that workshop Look, today. <laughs> I'm not going to be silenced, okay? But I, <laughs> I'm willing to accept that the chat is probably not the right place. To, to have it out. <laughs> yeah. So other than Gaylard's influence on the chat in the Nuke Med workshop, other things to look forward to on day four include the return of me. I'm back, baby. I'm hosting the general MSK session and the advanced spine imaging session with lectures on commonly missed fractures by Andrew Murphy, commonly missed dislocations by Craig Hacking, two lumbar spine x-ray interpretation masterclasses by Matt Skalski. They are masterclasses. They really are. A post-operative lumbar spine lecture by the one and only Wendy Gibbs. She's amazing. And a spinal infection and biopsy tip lecture from Syed Junaid, who's in the UK. So like, I'm pretty busy today. Uh, so I've got to get away from this podcast episode and actually start planning out my day, Gaylard. Plus there are five live cases that I'm showing throughout the day today. So I'm a very, very busy man. What are you going to do today, Gaylord? Uh, Nothing, except (laughs) maybe the cocktail of the day. That's my contribution to day four. I'm doing like three sessions, showing live cases left, right and center, and you're just doing a cocktail. I I certainly hope that's all I'm doing because I haven't prepared anything else. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, before we do that, I better mention just the, the one other session not to miss today, and that is the interventional oncology session. This one's hosted by Heather Moriarty, who's uh, been on the podcast uh, a few times, uh, and it features lectures by Heather, um, Stephen Power, and Roberto Casato. And I've had a sneak peek at the session. It's absolutely fascinating. So all about interventional oncology, taste and cert and different ablation techniques. And some of the, the cases that Roberto shows, some of the ways in which they're approaching lesions in order to freeze them into ice balls for your cocktails, <laughs> no, not for your cocktails, are amazing. But we have got a cocktail of the day. So that segues nicely. Do you want to do that first, Frank? Yep. I think that's, uh, that'd be good because today's cocktail is, is... drum roll. The martini. Ah. It's such a classic drink, right? It's often misunderstood and I love them dearly, perhaps more than I should. It's especially good because over the last 10 years or so, Australia has had a real resurgence. I'm not sure it's a resurgence because I'm not sure Australia ever made gin before. A surgence. A (laughs) surgence? A surgence. Just surgence. Australia has a a surgence of gin. And we've been... uh, not just locally, but we've been dominating the international gin scene, winning many of the best gins and best distillery awards out there. Mm-hmm. So what is a martini? So I'm, I'm not going to include any of the drinks that people call a martini because they're served in a martini glass but aren't martinis, okay. like coffee martini. That's not mm-hmm. a real martini. No, no more than a, a prawn cocktail is a martini just because <laughs> you serve it in a cocktail drink. <laughs> But when you're ordering a martini, there's three or four things you need to stipulate to order this. <laughs> this sounds correctly. like a lecture. <laughs> right. Firstly, it's what spirit do you want? Do you want it gin-based or vodka-based? Okay. Regardless of James Bond, gin-based martinis are far better. Vodka is just a terrible alcohol. Blech. Then you can ask whether it's wet or dry. And this is not okay. how much water there is in it. It's how much v- vermouth. And it's not sweet oh. vermouth. It's dry white vermouth, completely not what you put in Negroni. If you want to make Negronis and martinis, 
You need two different bottles of vermouth. You can't just skimp and just get the one. I'm going to have to take notes. You do. <laughs> Wet means a lot. Dry means not very much. And okay. then you also need to stipulate what garnish you want. So do okay. you want a twist of lemon or a sprig of rosemary or olives, etc. And then the fourth one, if you add olives, then you can ask whether you should say whether you like your cocktail dirty or not. And no. that's how much of the brine from the olives you add to the cocktail. So I definitely have to get olives because I'd want to be able to say that I want it dirty. So a, a dirty wet martini is one with olives, brine, and lots of vermouth. <laughs> nice. Personally, I favor a dry gin martini with a lemon uh-huh. twist. That's kind of the thing I like the most. And in this one, unlike the Negroni where you can use low-end gin, here mm-hmm. you want to use a gin that's really good because that's the one thing you're going to taste. So there's lots of really good Australian ones. You can try them out, like Four Pillars. It's a great, the Melbourne Gin Company makes a really good martini. There's lots. And you don't even need to add vermouth if you don't want to. If you just want cold gin, which isn't, yeah. strictly speaking, a cocktail, I suppose, <laughs> Um, that's called a Winston Churchill because apparently he said when asked how much vermouth he wanted in his martini, he said that he likes to observe the vermouth from across the room. <laughs> <laughs> but not in the glass. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I actually remember the first time I really had a, a gin martini was with you in Seattle many, many years ago. Oh, I actually right. have quite a vivid memory of it because I remember sitting there and thinking, this is, this is quite good. I'm getting drunk very quickly. <laughs> you get drunk very quickly. There's a saying that one martini isn't enough, two martinis is too many, and three <laughs> martinis is not enough. <laughs> so the other thing then you might get asked, uh, usually not, but whether you want it shaken or stirred. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, some people say that shaking the gin bruises it. I, I don't know what that even means. But mm-hmm. it definitely if you shake a drink, you dilute it less than stirring. So you end up with a stronger drink. And in fact, if you shake a martini, particularly a very dry martini and pour it, it'll come out really thick. It's like uh, Mm -hmm. IV contrast. That cold IV contrast is kind of noticeably more viscous than uh, warm. So shaking it cools it quicker and therefore less water melts into it. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Yep. Yep. So you get a stronger, a stronger drink. Because there will be review questions after this podcast. (laughs) For CME purposes. (laughs) So if you're going to make it, you get a mixing glass or a shaker, fill it with ice, add some gin, like say two ounces, Mm -hmm. and some vermouth, maybe a quarter of an ounce. That'll give you a one to eight ratio. That's pretty good. Ernest Hemingway apparently liked his martinis with a 15 to 1 ratio, which means he could just realistically leave a bottle of gin in the freezer and he'd be done. (laughs) (laughs) So then you cool it down, shake it or stir, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. put it in a martini glass. Well, we'll get to this because this is my pet goat, but you want to cool your martini glass down first. You need to chill it because Mm -hmm. warm gin just doesn't taste very good so that's when they just put ice blocks in it and then they let them sit there while they're doing the rest yeah you can do that or just put it in the freezer for five minutes beforehand okay and then when you pour it you double strain it um and you probably don't need to double strain it just single strain it is fine because there's no like pulpy stuff to get Mm -hmm. rid of not like a pita colada no god (laughs) you then add your olive and you add your garnish if you're adding a lemon twist don't forget to to express the oils on top. Mm. So you squeeze it and all those oils float on top and you I get that beautiful smell. I remember you showing smell. me that as well, Frank. Oh, that's I've, very I've learned so much from you. Not much radiology, <laughs> but a lot about drinking. <laughs> so here's my pet goat because we know we have to have one pet goat per episode. That's right. This is it, guys. This is your one for the episode. And that is that the classic martini glass, which is a conical in shape. Mm-hmm. Usually you get served these massive glasses and martinis are big, right? As in the martini glasses are usually quite big. So you get this big volume of drink. And then you're left with the choice of, do I drink this fast enough so that it never warms up? Or do I drink this at a normal human level, but end up with warm, wet gin at the bottom of the glass? <laughs> yeah. And usually I I've almost always err on the side of drinking it fast enough so that it's still cold. Mm-hmm. But then you run into the second pet hate about martini glasses and that's that their shape is entirely made to not contain liquid within the glass (laughs) 
especially <laughs> after the second martini, any <laughs> slight movement and the entire content of your drink yeah. seems to magically teleport <laughs> next to the glass and fall into your lap. It's a safety or feature. <laughs> onto the chest of whoever's standing next to you. <laughs> I did this just the other night. I was having a Negroni in a respectable glass <laughs> and my wife's having, I can't even remember what she was having, but it was in a martini glass. I'm like, oh, you're going to spill that. And she's like, no, no, I'll be fine. Three seconds later, spilt. You know, like it's just the wrong shape. It's a terrible shape. So you can put it in all sorts of other glasses, right? You just need a stemmed glass. It needs to be small enough so that you can drink it at the rate that you want to drink it so it doesn't get too warm and preferably so it doesn't just leave the glass. As far as a non-alcoholic version, I, I don't think you can really do a non-alcoholic <laughs> martini. But it's here's the caveat. Just a twist of lemon. <laughs> just When you go to a bar, so many people who order a martini only do so because one, it's the, the cocktail that they know the name of and mm -hmm. two, they think it's classy. So if that's the reason you're ordering martini, just get soda water with a twist of lemon <laughs> and you're fine. If you want a mocktail, that's fine. Otherwise, get something else because I don't think even with distilled zero alcohol gins, like they'll taste like gin, but they won't have the mouth feel of alcohol and it'll be just no, no, rubbish. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I thoroughly agree with you about the whole martini glass shape. It's ridiculous. Well, we have a shared it, goat. We have a shared goat. That's right. Where are we going to house him? Maybe a few days a week at my house and then the rest of the week at your house. Maybe you can have him on weekends. <laughs> How much garden have you got? <laughs> I've got a lot of mint. <laughs> he might. <laughs> we better wrap up this mini episode for day four of the conference and let people head out and enjoy a bit of MSK and spine and interventional oncology today, along with an extra special nuclear medicine workshop <laughs> where Frank will be in the live chat ready to nibble your ear. Now, Frank, how can people get in contact with us? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylard and Dr. Andrew Dixon. And you can also email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and or feedback. Mm -hmm. Custody for goats. If you have any ideas, who should have it most of the yep. week? Let us know. Uh, remember that registrations for the conference close at the end of tomorrow. Okay, so register mm -hmm. now if you haven't already and you'll be able to catch up on everything and when i say you'll be able to catch up on everything not just you know it's not low quality you know replays of lectures this is high definition lectures this is fully enhanced sessions with scrollable cases that appear below review questions that you can attempt so there is a huge huge amount of value in watching this conference even on demand even if you missed the live sessions and and what else can people do to help us out frank well, people can also help us out by leaving a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. That's correct. All right. Well, we'll catch you all again back here tomorrow for the very final day mm. of Radiopedia 2023, 2023. And guess what? We've got a special guest tomorrow. Oh, do we? Yeah, well, I won't say who it is, teaser. but there's a special yeah, teaser. That's what we're doing on these. Uh, so, yeah, have a great day. Enjoy those MSK and Spine lectures. Check out the workshop and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Stay rad, everyone. Stay rad. Shaken, but not stirred. Stay rad. Don't spill your drinks. See you tomorrow, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.